With its vast, lush landscapes, majestic forests, frostbitten mountains and endless lakes, it's no surprise that Scandinavia has long since inspired fantastical legends of the cryptic creatures that are said to dwell within its untamed wilderness. From the pagan gods of the Norse canon to the fairy tale fiends typical of Northern Europe, these breathtaking vistas have given rise to stories that have played an integral role across various societies and popular culture. That includes video games, an example from last year being Dimfrost Studios' Bramble the Mountain King. This action adventure title harnesses actual Scandinavian myths and monsters to shape its phantasmagorical world of sorrow and horror. So put on your warmest winter coat and grab your crucifix because we're going to quest to the frozen north to learn the truth behind these monsters. Morbid tales. Before we set off though, I will need to talk relatively in depth about elements throughout the game, so be warned that spoilers lie ahead. If you're a fan of the likes of Limbo, Inside, Little Nightmares and Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, go enjoy it blindly first, then come back for today's lesson. Also bear in mind that it has some pretty horrific and distressing scenes, some of which I'll be showing, so if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, can I offer you a nice Mario video in this trying time? Bramble follows the story of a young boy, Ola, who awakens one night and follows his sister, Lilimore, into the moonlight. They quickly find themselves shrunken down and spirited away to a magical world where they frolic with cute critters and junk. But when Lilimore is kidnapped, Ola has to brave this dark fantasy world alone to save his older sibling. The first things that Ola encounters are a number of humanoid little sprites. Fairies need no real introduction. Same goes for gnomes, depictions of which are common across culture and folklore, like the ones that tastefully adorn front lawns the world over, and the ones that steal your underpants at night. Most of the ones in the game are very childlike, except for a bearded elder who's more akin to the typical imagery. I was so sad when one of them got stuck in a bear trap that I reset from my last checkpoint to try and save him, only to find that their house gets stomped to pieces after you deliver them safely anyway. You later sacrifice another one to an unseen beast to save yourself, as if I didn't already have PTSD for the trap incident. The seemingly lesser little people are the Rumpnissar, which Ola has to herd into a paddock. According to the designer, they were inspired by the homunculi of the same name from classic novel Ronja the Robber's Daughter by Swedish author Astrid Lindgren. But here, they're more visually similar to the creations of Elsa Besko, a fellow Swedish author and illustrator known for her cheerful selves wearing various pieces of vegetation as hats. The gnomes are seen to practice agriculture using the Rumpnissar, reminiscent of how in Scandinavian folklore, gnomes are said to live on a farmstead in harmony with a homeowner who treated them with respect. The Kota folk, or cone people, meanwhile, appear to be an original creation, but share a similar aesthetic premise. Things are soon fucked up by another well-known supernatural archetype, a troll. These guys appear as far back as the 13th century in medieval literature, and as recently as 2022's functionally named movie, Troll. Bramble takes inspiration from various works of art in its character and world design, including the illustrations of Norwegians Theodor Kittelsen and Erik Verenskjöld, but particularly Sweden's Jon Bauer when it comes to trolls. He featured them prominently within his work, among other mythical figures, based on the ones that he claimed to sense in the wilderness in which he lived. I won't digress into his life story too much, but it's a sombre, perhaps even spooky one. Having spent years living amongst the trees and its otherworldly inhabitants, Bauer and his family died while travelling back to Stockholm from their rural home when their ferry capsized on Lake Vettin. It was a tragic accident, but superstitious Swedes believed that the nature spirits were offended by his betrayal and hadn't let him leave with his life. The trolls in Bramble resemble his imaginary friends with their long hair and big noses. One illustration even seems to portray a boy hiding from one of them behind some deer, bringing to mind the way Ola ducks behind the scenery to avoid a towering troll at one point. The friendly Lemus character is also modelled on one of Bauer's works. Known alternatively as Jutnar, you might say giants and trolls make up the Scandinavian mythological landscape, and according to legend, or at least the tourist board, the physical landscape too. Several earthen landmarks are said to have once been these creatures, turned to stone by sunlight, their fatal weakness. No flash photography on the trolls, please. This photophobia is reflected in the game when Ola uses his lightstone, the spark of courage, to petrify a troll that grabs him. The young boy's name even carries a significant connotation. He's named for the Catholic Saint Olav, who in a fairy tale turned a troll to stone by uttering its name from his Christian lips. The next foe we encounter is Nikin, a malicious water spirit. He was once a human who loved playing the violin, but was bullied and beaten by the other villagers. Eventually he reached his limit break and marched into the town playing forbidden melodies that made the people dance uncontrollably until they died from exhaustion. Having inadvertently also killed the woman he loved in the process, he went to live by the lake where his sadness and anger turned him into the monstrosity that exists today. Approaching the lake, Ola can be seen covering his ears in an attempt to resist the alluring music, but ends up being led into an intense chase sequence. Afterwards, he finds what appear to be the skeletons of an adult and child, the grown-up covering the little one's ears, having seemingly given their lives trying to resist venturing into the cursed waters, choosing instead to perish in this cave. 
Nekin is indeed a malevolent shapeshift and water spirit in actual Nordic folklore. Like in the game, he's said to appear as a handsome man wielding a fiddle who would lure victims into the water with his enchanting music. He can even sometimes take the form of a beautiful horse and would entice people to climb onto his back for a ride, only to find they couldn't get off and were trotted into the depths. These equine shapeshifters are seen across various worldly tales, including the Kelpies of my native Scotland. Bramble's Nekin, however, conflates two musical mythologies, the other being the Swedish fable of the Horga Dance, in which the residents of the titular town found that they could not stop dancing to the music of a mysterious fiddler. He led them to a distant hill, where upon seeing that he had goat hoofs instead of feet, the revellers realised this malicious musician was the devil himself. He played on through the night. The broken and battered townsfolk beginning to drop dead until all that was left was their corpses twitching in the light of dawn, even in death still trying to dance to the devil's music. One of the few friendly souls Ola meets on his journey is Tuva, an ethereal young woman who acts as a light in an otherwise dark world, tending to the injured boy and powering up his lightstone. She's based on the Swedish tale of Princess Tuvstar, a naive girl who goes on an adventure with a talking moose but is soon robbed of all her possessions before losing the golden heart gifted to her by her mother in the murky depths of a lake. Tuva's introductory scene recreates an illustration of Tuvstar by the aforementioned Jon Bauer. Her fixation on the lightstone parallels the literary character's desire for her missing heart. The slaughtered moose that Ola sees in the Trolls Macabre Kitchen was influenced by Scoot, the moose from the fairy tale. He doesn't play a role in the game's narrative, it's kinda hard being dead, but the designer gave him a body closer to that of a werewolf, dexterity that allowed him to pluck apples from a tree, maybe to give to Tuva. Perhaps that's why she looks so sad as she sits by the water's edge, having lost her companion to the troll's wicked ways and finding herself alone in the world like Ola, her heart a symbol of the children's lost innocence. The Sherhek San, or Marsh Witch, isn't based on any specific myth, other than the very general theme of witches and pagan rituals. According to the developers, she presented herself as a midwife who would ostensibly care for unwanted children but had an evil plot to sacrifice them in a ritual that would give her power and immortality. This is akin to flying ointment, historically documented as a hallucinogenic concoction that witches would use to grant themselves the power of flight, gruesomely made from the innards of unbaptized little ones. The outraged villagers burned the Sherhiksan at the stake, reflective of the fate that befell many women accused of witchcraft in the Middle Ages, but she survived to see out her nefarious plans. Ola interrupts her midwife carrying out the ritualistic slaughter, but is unfortunately too late to save the child. This leads to quite a depressing, distressing cinematic in which he gives the dead child a proper burial. He finds the graves of other infant victims as well as the midwife hanging from a tree. Perhaps she was secretly burying them after following the Sherhiksan's evil instructions, but couldn't live with the guilt anymore. The shadowy entities that inhabit the swamp around the witch's house are confirmed to be Mulingar, which in Swedish folklore are the lost souls of unbaptized, abandoned children. The sheer number of them and the implication that goes with that makes this one of the game's bleakest moments. Another friendly face that Ola meets is the Lichtgobin, which translates to Lantern Man. Living up to his name, and with Ola heeding Tuva's instructions to follow the light, the Lichtgobin guides the boy out of the dark swamp and into the warmth and safety of the library. He's an ancient being who collects histories of the world, has studied the place where Ola can first read about the Mountain King. Like his in-game counterpart, the supposed real-world Lichtgobin is a wandering spirit who people might bump into while lost in the woods. If you grease his palm, he'll lead you to safety, but fail to do so and you might never find your way. He's synonymous with Willow the Wisp and other reported sightings of ghostly lights which have been attributed to otherworldly wanderers. In reality, these are thought to be caused by methane gas released from decaying plant matter or bioluminescence in certain flora and fauna, but why let science ruin a good spooky story? Parting ways with the old man, Ola sees his kidnapped sister ahead of him and follows her into a clearing. The illusion then fades to reveal a woman with antlers, a tail and an exposed heart in her gaping back who attacks her hero. This is a Skogsroa, a forest nymph who according to Swedish legend would use her beauty to seduce men into her lair. Depending on how a man treated the Skogsroa, he might be blessed with good fortune in the hunt and some men might even marry her, but those who were unfaithful or disrespected their bucolic bow, such as making fun of her tail, would be cursed or perhaps never seen again. The seduction aspect is made much more age appropriate when it comes to Ola, with the Skogsroa toying with the lad's emotions by instead tricking him with visions of his beloved sister. The brutal way in which he ultimately slays her before breaking down in tears drives home the pain he's feeling, no doubt worsened from seeing murdered children in the previous chapter. As with Nekin, we learn of the nymph's devilish deeds after the battle with her. Arriving in the abandoned ruins of the nearby Nilshult village, we see hanged and crucified women, killed in a witch hunt in an effort to destroy whichever one was the man-stealing culprit. The forest upon which the villagers depended burnt to a smolder. A group of brave men who had ventured out to stop the Skogsroa ended up being entranced by her and became the bodies nailed to the trees, from whose infatuated heart she drew power and which the protagonist had to target to stop her. It's a chilling method of environmental storytelling that brings to life the darkly rich nature of Swedish folklore. 
the village turns out not to be as abandoned as it seems. A diary he finds chronicles a plague that took hold of the settlement and wipes everyone out, leaving only Draugr, reanimated corpses from Scandi mythology. They're not the boy's biggest problem though, that would be this mysterious old woman watching him from afar. This is Pesta, an embodiment of the Black Death, the plague brought to Norway by an English ship in 1349. A fictionalised account of this event claims that the crew all died at sea and the ghost ship washed up on the shores of Bergen by chance, unleashing the disease on the natives. As metal as this sounds, Again, it's probably favouring fiction over fact for the sake of spinning a yarn. Pesta's name stems from the Latin pestis, itself coming from plagas, where we get words like plague and pestilence through various European languages, all bearing overlapping meanings. If she arrived at your house carrying a rake, your family might just survive the impending sickness. If she was wielding a broom, you were screwed. Here she uses her rake in battle, symbolising how Ola does have a chance of rescuing his sister. And also probably because a broom wouldn't be very thematically interesting, compared to having to dodge and weave through the prongs of a rake. One story describes how she hitched a ride in the rowing boat of an unsuspecting man who realised who she was halfway across the lake and begged her for mercy. The old hag repaid his kindness by allowing him to fall into a deep sleep and die a quick, painless death. This is depicted in a painting by Keterson, and the game appears to reference this too, Pesta hijacking Ola's boat and pulling him into a nightmarish realm. Last but not least is the eponymous final boss, the Mountain King. Troll kings have existed through the ages in folklore, but the most famous example is undoubtedly the one from Per Gint, a fairy tale which later inspired a play by Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen, in which the main character enters the domain of the trolls in the Dovrefjell Mountains and ends up nearly marrying the king's daughter. This is where the well-known piece of music in the Hall of the Mountain King comes from. I've always loved this, and as soon as I heard about the game, I wondered if the name was a reference to Per Gint. I was stoked to find that an excellent epic version is used as the boss theme. The king was originally envisioned as a troll-like monster who was so huge that he'd eat children from a bag like crisps, but they eventually decided he'd retain his human form, although keeping the immense size. His yellow and blue robes are also a neat reference to the flag of Sweden. And that concludes our Scandinavian sojourn through the wild and wonderful world of Bramble the Mountain King. It was a definite highlight of mine from last year and well worth your time if, like me, you like your games with a bit of real world lore. The knowledge and passion of the devs for their part of the world is palpable, and the intricate adaptation of its history makes this fantasy world a rich and intriguing experience for those who want to delve deeper into its creation and see how it brings Scandinavian legends to life.